Welcome everyone to Color Commentary. We are your popper commentators, Michael Petrick and Adrian Guarzalez. How's it going, Adrian? Mike, I think you know. Tell me. Pretty good? It is good. It is uh, good. I'm, you I'm did just, the thing. I'm, I'm just chilling back here with my dog in my office. Gonna have a good evening tonight. We're gonna talk about some some stuff uh we're gonna holler about the magic we are we are um let's get our upkeep stuff out of the way so we can get into this yeah. behemoth series of notes i've taken for this yeah. episode um all right I'll take so it away. yeah yeah what do you have for us well like every week we have a patreon for just a dollar an episode you can hear the full show including the pre and post shows and get access to our patron exclusive Discord channel. Mike, I think this might be the old script, but you know what? We're gonna run with it. Yeah. Uh you you even if you're not a patron, you get all of the actual magic content. There's just us goofing around on either end for a yeah, little bit. Yeah, if you want to we talk I'll just I'll give the I'll give them a little something to wet their whistle. We talked about Year of the Black Rainbow in the pre show today. So, you know, if you if you're into that the, the the patreon might be for you yeah uh, get to know us as people um all right we are also brought to you in part by hipsters of the coast they have uh, their magic content hub with content for all sorts of different formats uh ranging from edh to vintage all that runs the whole gamut so if you're looking for some magic content i would suggest going and checking them out and Give them a follow on social media so you can be appraised of when new stories and articles come out and show them a little bit of love. Smash that like button, like and subscribe, <laughs> hipsters of the coast. Yep, yep, pretty much, pretty much. Like, like in, I, I don't think we have a video content channel for them, but yeah, like and subscribe. All, 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 all that good, real internet content creator stuff. All right, Adrian. <laughs> so, That's me. Last night, or yesterday, I, I think I actually texted you in the morning about this. Yeah, it was oh, about 6.50 a.m. Central Standard Time. Yes, I was up very early. I uh, I went up to New Hampshire to participate in a off-site meeting, which was a hell of a trip, let me tell you. But... Um, well, I, I can't believe you didn't tell this story on the pre-show. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> Keep going. Any, anyways, I texted you very early morning and said, hey... Will you be willing to sit down and watch a three-hour-long documentary? I think we have an episode nestled within this documentary, um, which is a tall ask, and you sat through three hours of documentary. How are you feeling about what you saw? Uh, better than I thought I would, given the nature of said documentary. I thought I was going to be kind of sad. I am kind of sad, but, you know, it I'm a nihilist. <laughs> not really. Uh, I made that joke earlier to Mike. Uh, I'm not really. Uh, you know, it is sort of. It's what it is. Um, what we're talking about is the documentary, the BBC documentary, Hypernormalization by Adam Curtis. So, Mike, why don't you go over it a little bit? Yeah. Um, and I do also want to. I w there will be a link in the description to a version of that. There's also another documentary that I'm going to mention in passing. I just want to cover this all at the top of the show. Uh, all Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace, which is another Adam Curtis documentary. It's not easily available, but if you can track it down, it is really interesting. Where, um, whereas Hypernormalization is available on YouTube. It is. Um, not sure 100% on the legal sitch there, but uh, if you live in England on the good side, it's probably on the BBC's website. Uh, so... We are going to talk about the concept of hypernormalization as it relates to Popper and the discourse surrounding the format as a whole. Um, to start things off, we're going to just start with a definition. So the word hyper, and, and I'm quoting here from a Wikipedia article about the term so that we can just get a baseline here. The word hypernormalization was coined by Alexei Yurchak, a pre professor of anthropology who was born in Leningrad and later went to teach in the United States. He introduced the word in his book, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More, The Last Soviet Generation, published in 2006, which describes the paradoxes of life in the Soviet Union during the 1970s and 1980s. He says that everyone in the Soviet Union knew the system was failing, but no one could imagine an alternative to the status quo, and politicians and citizens alike were resigned to maintaining the presence of uh, the pretense of a functioning society. Over time, this delusion became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and the fakeness was accepted by everyone as real, an effect that Yurchak termed hypernormalization. So, in, in layman's terms, Mike, uh, being that I'm sort of the naive 
party, even though I did watch the documentary. Um, that basically, what this is trying to say is that hypernormalization is the idea that things become a certain way, but everyone still participates, even though it's fake because they cannot imagine life without the system is that basically what you're saying yeah the the basic gist of this is it's sort of the whole like if you if you believe in something strongly enough it just kind of becomes how it is um it, it's it's like a philosophical thing about like if every if everyone is believing the same thing it's pretty much viewed as true it's right and so the context of this documentary is more about uh politics specifically in the western world you know the very specifically the united states and england um but what we are wanting to do with with the show is sort of apply this concept to the discourse surrounding gush and i know we said that already i just want to make sure that after the your your uh, definition they were all still on the same page yeah and and we did want to talk about this because there is a ban and restricted announcement coming out next monday so we know that we have tread on this topic before but we kind of wanted to give a little bit more of a discussion to how this topic has been approached by the community as a whole um so obviously gush has been a part of the format for ages and I think really the big turning point with regards to how the card was discussed was when friend of the show and friend of us, uh, Alex Allman, called, wrote an article that posited that it was perhaps time to remove Gush from the format. And coincidentally, this was around the time that Foil got downshifted. Is that is my timing on that correct? Or was, was he advocating for a ban before before foil i believe that he had at least mentioned it as a possibility but right. when when foil hit that was sort of the that i i would point to that as the big sort of the big bang in terms of this argument within the popper community gotcha. that's definitely and, when it like ramped up and for for what it's worth also um just to give a little bit more backstory and i know we're going to address some of these points more later you know in, in a little more depth I think the other time that people started thinking it might be too powerful was when Augur got downshifted. Before that, Gush was a good card, but I just don't think it was as ubiquitous as it is now. Now, granted, I'm not just saying that these two cards are the reason people started talking about it. For example, we've got competitive leagues in that time. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of moving parts that Mike and I, for the sake of the show, are attempting to condense into an hour. But really, there are years of history in the making behind gush eventually rising to the top of the pack and sort of being undisplaceable yeah and i i think another part is the fact that we do have more eyes on the format more people are discussing about it and theory crafting and i think it means uh i i know limited resources refers to it as the the quantum time traveling supercomputer the the sort of end result of a bunch of people plugging away at a format makes it get solved reasonably quickly and i think that with more eyes on the format we had more people working on this and sort of refining what exactly could be done in popper and we definitely have people out there who have put in a lot of time specifically on the blue black delver variant that emerged within the past year um yeah so, so yeah, so Alex sort of rallied to the cause of banning Gush after Foil was printed. And in the past, Alex has not not been a figure without controversy. There are certain people out there who will completely disagree with him regardless of the situation. There, and that is that is just kind of something that's going to happen when he is for better or worse one of the more prominent figures in the community um so yeah so there was kind of this big fracture though around this because in the past alex has called for bans on stuff that did eventually get banned um i for example most most noticeably drake drake and cloud of fairies he had written articles about cloud of fairies okay. being a problem in the format for ages and people reacted i mean i i was around for cloud but i wasn't so much in the community at that point but people reacted pretty heatedly uh around drake but i think people resigned themselves a lot quicker to the fact that drake was fundamentally broken in some way and i think in part that was the fact that drake had showed up and immediately took over 
Whereas Gush has been in the format long enough where it is part of the greater landscape of the format and has been for a long time. Like we've never played Popper in a time where Gush wasn't there. It's just kind of always been there. And we'll get more into that later. But I think I think part of the reason why people came around on the Drake issue eventually was merely the fact that like I I forget what it was at like something like twenty five or thirty percent of the metagame. And that's just well, not not good people, for a format. People think all the Delver decks are somehow different decks too, but you know, I digress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh obviously we have our own opinions in this and we can't yeah. like we're not going to separate from these. This is more sort of a focused discussion on the the climate right now when it comes to popper um all right so the next thing i want to get into is sort of discussing how how we get to these points where things become normalized and so outside of magic hyper normalization takes place on like a massive level there are things that become ingested by a society and go on to become the norm and this happens in all sorts of facets of life it happens in both directions on a political on on all directions on a political scale where we're changing exactly where the discussion takes place um and normalization in you know our country right now has involved a shift to more conservative politics over time and you know, there, there's there's microcosm examples of this as well, but it's it's kind of a it's kind of a dicey thing to get into on a podcast like this. But I think I think one of the big things when it comes to this as it applies to Popper, I think a large part is how small our community is. I think that voices resonate a little bit louder in our community. Right. Well, so you know, to sort of expound on that a little bit. The primary face of the community, for better or for worse, is Reddit, right? And the Discord server, I, either of them, both of them, you know, take what, what you will. That is a format's online presence, and Moto, MTG Goldfish is as well. You know, you have these tournaments in Italy or uh, Brazil where people don't think Gush is really a problem, but, you know, that's not the international face of the community. Moto is. The Reddit is. The, the Discord is. So... You know, for better or for worse, that's where the conversation is taking place. Not on, so much on the local level, but more on the international internet stage. Yeah, and and even with that, it's a relatively small like group of people who actually yes. play the format. Like, if you look at challenge results, it's like the same five people who win every week. And like chal- top top eight, the challenges only represent like a like at most like. 70 80 person sliver of the community like i'm looking at i'm looking at the the popper subreddit and it's 28.6 thousand members that's not a gigantic population obviously it seems large when you just put the number out there but like that's a medium-sized you all, town you know something like five million people play magic so yeah yeah we we are a tiny drop in that bucket so that sort of perspective, I think. I think the fact that Popper is such a relatively closed off community, because up until recently, like you were either a fan of Popper or you weren't, and there wasn't kind of there weren't large level content creators talking about the format, and as a result, it was somewhat sealed off. Like you kind of had to know someone who was into Popper or had have exposure to the format through some other means in order to actually get into the format. So it meant that sort of your entry point to the format would highly influence how you perceived the format as a whole. And I think that one of the things about these sort of small communities is there is a level of groupthink and sort of the echo chamber effect that can occur in these smaller yes. populations. And and um, Curtis actually goes into this in hypernormalization. He specifically references Facebook, where because of the algorithms that that platform uses, you're only ever going to see your own opinion. Yeah, and, and I know that recently, uh, actually, Twitter, as an example, is introducing a feature where it <laughs> great, greatly maligned feature where it tries. They they've talked about showing you specifically opinions you disagree with. Um, That's and probably a, a good idea, to be honest. But I mean, within reason, I think it's a fine idea. But 
yeah like i i do think that across popper like there's only so many people you're going to agree with a certain percentage of them on a given issue like you're not gonna have like the nuance in terms of how many different like facets of an argument there can be is not super great just because you're not having a huge number of voices out there. And I I mean, I mean, I kind of talked uh, in our notes here. I have stuff about like sort of a modern form of tribalism within magic discourse as a whole, where like different formats sometimes kind of sequester themselves off and, they don't really have a lot of outside I, influence. I would argue, no matter no matter what side you're on, um, you know, I, Mike and I will definitely discuss our positions if we want to. I'm not trying to hide anything, but th- no matter what side you're on, I think you would even go so I would even go so far as to say that uh, mainstream magic discourse, overarching magic discourse, has become tribalized mainly because of politics in the real world. You know, I'm thinking of specifically Autumn, Autumn Birch, for example, um, or Yu Yu Watanabe. Yeah. So, and, and how people are so divided over those two people. Yeah, like re- recent discourse regarding like ongoings in the MPL. I'm not going to get into that because that is a whole yeah, can yeah, of worms. Yeah, that's a whole other can of worms. I'm, I'm just saying like, you know, it's not so much, it's not even just that people sequester themselves, it's that people divide themselves pretty heavily on tribal lines, even in the overarching community issues. Yeah. And I, well, I don't think you should be like subjected to opinions without any like say in the matter. Like there is a level where like discussions are happening in private and the only thing that we see so like if you have two opposing sides of an argument when all the discussions behind them happen behind the scenes where the others can't see it you kind of run into the situation where when the discussion becomes public there's a deepened sort of level of animosity because there has been like maybe 10 hours of discussion of this in these sort of echo chamber locations and Just riling each other up yeah, like I, I, I do think that there is a level of that where because we have sort of sequestered ourselves along arbitrary lines that we do wind up with these sort of more extreme opinions than we would otherwise have. Um, and there is also, as as I mentioned when we when I talked about our sources for this episode, the documentary all watched over by machines of love and grace, which I did not make Adrian watch because I did not want him to devote six hours to very long British documentaries. Um, is Mike, I, I barely watched that one. <laughs> Another one. It, so, so, so the main gist of it is it's, it, it is a piece on how, how we were promised something great from the rise of technology, from sort of the dawn of modern computing. And it has resulted in something vastly different than that with the advent of the internet. Um, so if that's something that interests you, go check that documentary out. But I do think that internet arguments function a lot differently than arguments that happen in person. Yes, a hundred percent. And uh, you, you, do you want to say why? Sorry, I cut you off a little. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go with it. So, so part of it is the fact that like the internet provides you with a level of anonymity and as a result, people people are more bold when there is less connection to their actual life. Yeah, and it's a lot easier to malign or not read into something. For example, um, I was on... I'll just say it. I was talking to Alex. He showed me some stuff people said about him, and they're just like they just took it completely the wrong way because they were able to because it's the internet, and then they just shit him relentlessly. Yeah, it, it it it. There's definitely there's definitely an effect within these venues of discussion, wherein people will take on far more extreme opinions, kind of because there is there is no consequence to it. Right, they're either they're egged on by everyone else. There's no dis- discerning opinion. They don't have a real person to sort of put this on. And in the case of Alex, it's a little, it's especially egregious because Alex is a public figure. Everyone knows what he looks like and what his name is. But they can attack him from the relative safety of anonymity. 
Exactly. And I think like in, in a way, like the fact that this conversation has to happen on the internet, both broadens its range. So you do get more people involved in the conversation, but there is a cost associated with that. Um, right. You, you know, it's the whole, like, don't read the, don't read the article comments when you go to a news site. There's like, yeah, be, therein lies only madness. Exactly. And I, I do think that like once, once you have your name on it, like there is like, you'll notice the way that I'm talking. This episode is a lot less, is, is a lot more slow than I usually speak on these episodes and part of it is because, like, yes, my name is out there, and it, it is a very real name, and I, I, there's, there's no way to hide. Like, if people want to, they can find my Facebook. Spoiler alert: I don't use it, but well, like plot twist, like, like, like we, we are out here with our actual names and our faces, and there's a level of visibility that that the anonymous commenter does not have. Um. And I think that I think that it's also why we have a podcast and they don't. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I and I think one of the important things is like once once sort of these polarized views become a lot more normalized within their respective communities, you start to see a change in terms of the discussion as a whole when it comes to and here's where we get into more politics nerd stuff. Um, we're going to discuss the Overton window, which I, I've, I, I've already I had to explain it to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had to explain it to Adrian. Um, so the Overton window within politics is when you have a spectrum an axis from one viewpoint to another, the Overton window represents the portion of that, that spectrum that people deem socially acceptable to discuss and present as your opinion. Um, and, the Overton window also, it, it relates to many forms of discourse. And when the Overton window is shifted or changed from where it was, it sort of, people tend to view the, sec, the, the Overton window as sort of the whole argument, ignoring the rest of the spectrum. So before you give the, you know, the example you're going to give, just to make sure I understand what you're saying, the Overton window is the realm, the circle of expectations in a discussion. So, it, as decided by societal norms. So, for example, you gave me a good one earlier. I'm going to sort of paraphrase it. Uh, on the internet, if you, the Overton, a uh, person who is just typing in all caps, yelling at people, and calling them names, is outside of the Overton window because that is not what our societal expectations say is okay on the internet, just as an example. Yeah, and, and to lighten things up, like like the, the goofball example I could give is like the Overton window for like how we should budget for schooling. Like there is probably someone out there whose opinion is, I don't know, just shoot kids in a rocket ship and teach them on the moon. And that falls outside the Overton window because it's so ridiculous and it doesn't it's not something that anyone ever wants to <laughs> put him on the moon let the moon sort him out <laughs> yeah like, like it's a patently ridiculous argument and that's because this construct exists and right. i actually got a very good example of this yes tell me so so within magic the topic of workshop or shops decks in vintage so for those unaware, Mishra's Workshop is a old land that I believe is only legal in Vintage and Commander at this point. It's not. That yeah, it's correct. It's banned in Legacy. It's it's definitely wildly banned in Legacy, um, but it, it's a land that taps for three mana with zero downside besides the fact that you can only use it to cast artifacts. And this has been a part of the Vintage format for as long as Vintage has been a format because. It's just an Urza's tower that requires no other, like, setup. Because vintage. Yeah, B because it's vintage. Vintage gets to do these ridiculous things. But back in the day, it was less of sort of an oppressive force within the format. And as time has gone on, they've printed new artifacts. And every time they print a new artifact that is good enough to see vintage play, shops gets better. Because it's the deck that gets to play artifacts at a very, very cheap rate. So... As time goes on, 
you have more you, well in vintage maybe not a huge amount but like more people are exposed to the format and over time shop starts to become sort of less and less healthy a lot of people have written about this that shops is not a great part of the vintage metagame and they wish it was banned so you start seeing the actual public opinion shift to encompass a larger array of the spectrum of needs to be banned doesn't need to be banned and the thing is what you might expect is that that sort of closes up the overton window in the center a little bit so you have discourse that is like well i think we should ban it i think we shouldn't in reality what happens is the people who really love shops have just stayed there and super prominent and so what you wind up with is an overton window that covers the sort of middle and slightly outside the center in terms of favoring a ban and the hard line that does not want a ban no matter what. And in this case, I do kind of get it, right? I don't know how much Mr. Workshop costs. I think it's over a grand. Let me... It's a lot. Well, but this scenario sounds awfully familiar. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the exact reason why I chose this as the example to discuss it. Like... Obviously, there are there are fundamental differences here in the fact that investing in a vintage deck is a little bit more money than investing in a popper deck. But yeah, yeah, okay, I looked it up. Mishra's Workshop, the TCG market price right now is $1,500. Like, this is $6,000 for a land, a playset of this land. 6000 6, USD. Yeah, that that is a lot of money. So I think that because you have sort of this element within the vintage discourse that is so hardlined, and because they have always had shops as part of the format, you sort of wind up with this attitude of, well, shops was fine back in the day. They've only printed a few new things for it. I think shops should still be legal. It's still the same deck. Like other decks have gotten new things. New decks have shown up. Shops isn't a problem. And so you wind up sort of with this this subgroup of vintage that has decided that shops is, as we approached the at the beginning of this, shops is the status quo. It's part of the format. It's not going to change. Why should it? And I think that in this example, I, I, any anyone who <laughs> is listening to this even remotely closely can figure out what we're getting at here. Right. You're... I mean, just take the same thing and then apply it to Gush, basically. Yeah, and so I, it's the same. It's the same argument, but framed over a different card that is going through a similar thing. Yeah, and I, I, I think, I think that's why when I heard this as an example of sort of a, a window shift, it made sense immediately. I was like, okay, cool. This is the same thing. It's been there for the whole length of the format. It was fine at the beginning. Similar to like as you as you said, like how, how bad was Gush when we started playing Popper? Like how influential on the it, format it was it? It feels like it. W- it feels like it wasn't because the best deck was mono black. The best deck was mono black, and on top of that, like Delver would usually play it as like a one, maybe two of, just so that it could kind of. Yeah, like, the only deck that I was like, that's got to play Gush was like, is it Blitz? Yeah, yeah. Is it Blitz was one of the decks. And because of the huge presence of Mono Black, like that deck doesn't do great against Edict effects. And you kind of yeah. had this really rough matchup in one of the top decks. And as Mono Black sort of faded into obscurity a little bit, we wound up with these Gush decks having a chance to shine and people getting to put in a ton of time with them. And now this card that was once sort of an innocuous piece like i'm not gonna say innocuous like it still was one of the best parts of that deck in terms of what it wanted to do but it wasn't like like when we started playing i would not have referred to is it gush as a or is is it blitz as a problem deck in the format right and yeah i agree do you think that was in part just the fact that like familiars was sort of the boogeyman of the format at the time yeah there's there's also that angle that familiars was the familiars play gush i feel like it didn't it didn't because you you had to run all the crews that's right yeah yeah it would have loved to right like 
Just being able to dig two, two for no, zero mana. Yeah, float, float two, gush, play cloud of fairies. Ah, oh, the combo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just start off my combo with drawing two cards to find the other half of it. Like, cool, neat. No, I, I just mean you have no. I just mean you have no lands. Oh, tap sure, it. sure, sure. I mean, I mean, hopefully you got your crews out before you try to start doing that combo. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, if 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 what was it? High tide had ever been legal. That deck probably would have loved Gush. That probably would have gotten Gush banned in a second because that deck is silly. In in the abstract, in the silly world wherein that got legalized. Yeah, the Overton, the over the Overton window. <laughs> um. So yeah. So so. Do we want to kind of get? I was going to say. Go ahead. That's what I was going to say. You want to get into the anti-ban arguments as examples of hybrid normalization. I kind of do because we we've talked about this on the show before, and as we've alluded to, like we actually honestly not alluded to at this point, like we are both in the camp that we think that gush needs to be banned. Personally, I'm also in the camp of monarch probably needs to be banned as well. Um, and maybe something out of Tron if it continues, if it turns out that it is a problematic force in the format. Um. And I do kind of want to talk about a couple things, and one of them actually ties very neatly into uh, into our shops discussion. And this is one that I've seen a fair number of times. That gush is sort of a unique quality of our format that, outside of vintage, you don't really get to play this card. And taking away would fundamentally well, change the format. Right. Our counter argument is uh, there are other things that you can point in the format that will continue to exist even if Gush is removed from the format. So basically, staking the identity of a, for- on a, of a format on one card is not really a good argument. And in fact, could point to the fact that, that card actually needs a ban. Right? Yeah. If, if your card, if your format is so dominated by one card that that's just like the face of the format. And, and I know what people might say. People might say, well, look at Brainstorm and Legacy. People do think that Brainstorm should be banned. Um, I don't think Wizards is going to ban Brainstorm, uh, but I'm just I'm just saying. You know, well, I, I also think like part of this argument is that it is a unique aspect. It's not the only unique aspect, but I do think that like keeping something in because it is unique. This this is, and I know I know you're not big on Commander, but like this is the same argument that drives me nuts as to why Soul Ring is legal in Commander. There's a bunch of people who are like, yeah, I. I just think it should be playable somewhere. And like, Adrian, have you have you ever cast a soul ring? Yeah, yes. How how did that feel for you? It felt like my best turn one play. <laughs> yeah, it it really really is. Like, and I I I don't think like just because this is something you only kind of get to do in this one format at least for a affordable a amount of money. Yeah, yeah. I, I do... <sighs> there is the catch of, like, all the stuff legal and popper is technically legal and vintage, here's, but let's be here's realistic. The thing that, here's the thing you could... Here's the thing you could argue for. Necropotence. Is that... Uh, that That's also legal in Commander, where it's very good. But I see the point you're making. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, you know, Soaring, also very powerful powerful i'm just saying necropotence is also a pretty unique effect i mean you know not anymore that they printed some other versions of it but you know pretty unique effect very strong effect definitely banned in a lot of places uh oh yeah not because it's unique not because being unique is bad but because it's so good yeah and again yeah i I do i do i do just think like the argument of uniqueness is not a solid one um and Again, like this, is, this ties back to our point about maintaining the status quo, where this is a part of the format. It's always been a part of the format. It is part of the unique aspects of our format. So there's your there's your link to the main main yeah, topic I, here. I saw an argument on Reddit. I think that like someone would quit if Gush was banned because that's the only reason they play the format. And it's like by saying that you do acknowledge that something is fundamentally broken about Gush. Yeah, w- without without explicitly saying it, you're kind of implying that like this card is good enough to get me to pick up an entire format, learn matchups and like get into it. It indicates that that is probably a really good card at the bare minimum. Like I'm, I, right. I, I, I'm not picking up formats because they have a card. I like in them. Right. So 
the next argument is that Monarch allows non-blue decks to thrive, which is actually a great example of normalization, as you note here. Uh, because what you're essentially saying is that these decks need to source a persistent card advantage in order to compete with Gush. So you're saying this, this mechanic is needed in order to fight Gush. So, so basically saying which a is, very which, powerful mechanic is needed to beat this other very powerful card. Right, and it sort of reminds me in a way of Skull Clamp because if you either played Skull Clamp or you played an anti Skull Clamp deck that also played four Skull Clamps. <laughs> yeah, um, you, you know, you know, like back at back in before it got banned. So it reminds me of that argument too. That's that is circular logic. Yeah, um, I, I I think it's a hundred like it, it is dependent on like it, it presumes the argument that gush should continue to exist in the format instead of coming at it from a point of view of why is monarch something that is thriving alongside gush and the answer is because it's one of the few things that keeps up in terms of card advantage and provides a persistent source of it um, and also lets you go over the decks that are not on the level of decks playing gush and, and, and or monarch um yeah, this this is this is like a great example of like an argument that has to be one level of like normalization deep because it has to accept that gush is okay and good for the format before it can actually even begin. It it kind of reminds me of like the environment, some of the environment debates where it's like, "Oh, you know, if the environment's too far gone, we'll you know, create a cloud to block out the sun." It's like you would rather fight the sun than admit that like some of the practices we have on the world are unsustainable. Like that's also hyper normalization, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there's a lot of like good parallels between this and other arguments in other places, but this is Sorry, one of the ones yeah, I'm that di- I'm digressing. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the ones that really kind of got my goat because I was like, mm, not not sure you're presenting the point you want to. Um another one that we've seen a lot and that I actually think has the most merit out of these, that gush isn't the problem and that either, and and it depends on who, who who's arguing this, it's either Augur Bolas, Ponder, or Preordain is the actual problem. And So, go ahead. And I think, and a large part of this is also pointing out that the decks that play gush tend to play these cards as well. Right. And, you know, we sort of touched on this earlier and actually was looking forward to this point so that we could address it together. Um, the times where Gush has gotten noticeably better has no, have been when Augur and Foil have been downshifted. So there are some folks who think, well, just get rid of Foil and Augur. But I would argue that in cases like this in the past, Wizards has banned the engine card, which in this case would be Gush. Yeah. I I uh, Gush is interesting because it doesn't win the game on the spot in a noticeable way, right? Like a lot of the other cards on our ban list do sort of signal that the game is over in a very clear way. Like Skull Clamp, if that resolves, you can kind of figure out how dead you are in an immediate quantifiable right. way. Like Storm uh, did you cards. did you mean Skull Clamp or Cranial Plating? Cranial Plating. I'm sorry. The the, the other okay. skull based equipment that needed to get banned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, or like the storm cards are very easy to point to like, oh, cool. You resolved a grape shot with storm equal, uh, just you one win. under my life total. Cool. Got it. Like they're very easy to parse, but gush provides sort of this big kick that can push a deck over the edge. But when you're playing against it, you don't know which cards they drew off the gush that enabled it. And there's sort of the, this feeling of like it probably helped, but you don't know for sure. Um, now I do I do think like this argument has the most water when it comes to the sort of side argument that Augur should be banned because it also stifles aggro decks, and I think that one is slightly fallacious, but I do think that there is a point that like. Augur does dig you into the cards you likely want to be casting in the deck you've included in anyway. And on top of that provides a body that is very defensive. I don't think this is what's stopping Stompy from doing well. 
I think what's stopping Stompy from doing well is right now there is a deck running free removal, free counter spells, and free card draw. And it's trying to resolve two twos for one. Um, yep. Yeah, it's and, and with regards to the Ponder Preordain thing, we did an episode about this, didn't we? Like way back when okay, Burning Tree Emissary was running wild, I think. Where we talked about yeah, I like think we did. Yeah, we talked about like does one of these things need to go from the format? So I don't think this is like the worst argument in favor of not banning Gush by virtue of like these other cantrips are actually probably problematic in the long run, and I would not be surprised if at some point one or the other goes. But and and Augur is a very good card. And if it turns out that Gush is removed on Monday and blue decks continue to dominate, that's the point where you'd come back and have to look at the format and say, why are these decks still doing well? Um, this, the next one, this is actually a point that you touched on earlier. The argument that uh, legacy shows blue dominated formats can be healthy. What do you have to say to that? Yeah, and <laughs> our counter argument here is that legacy is a fundamentally different format that not only has answers to blue across all colors, but in fact, the most popular answers to posing blue decks are in no colors. I speak, of course, of Chalice of the Void. Yeah. And Ch Cavern of Souls. Chalice does a good job. Cavern puts in work. You can play Hydro. Uh, you can play Pyroblast and Red Elemental Blast. Um, right. I think that I also, touching on those, I think those are traps when talking about how to beat Gush. Just that's fair way. that 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 is fair um and and decks still play them right they are still the best piece of blue hate material for the sideboard but oh yeah they're great yeah they it, it doesn't it, it is not a perfect solution to the problem um but yeah like th think about like legacy legacy is a format of powerful things and powerful answers because like yeah Resolving Chalice on one versus Delver, you probably feel pretty okay. Like the Delver deck, not the actual card, but um, right. There's just there's yeah, there, there's just very powerful answers across multiple colors and in no colors, so that any deck can play it if they really want to. Yeah, um, and also Brainstorm's not free. I know it's one mana. It's not free. There is a really sizable difference there, and. Yeah, if you're not doing something as proactive as a lot of legacy decks, card advantage can be the turning point for a game very easily. Um, and what, what what is the last argument on our list? Our next point is that we should just wait for things to get better by themselves. <laughs> um, basically saying that downshifts are the answer instead of bans. Sorry I laughed there. Um, it's just that, you know, looking at the last couple of years in commons even in master's products we just don't have anything that's on par with gush or even remotely close so it feels sort of like you're holding out for a miracle that's never going to come yeah i think i think that's a really valid point there that we haven't seen anything on par with gush like foil is very good don't get me wrong like that was a wild thing to see downshifted and even like fire ice which recently has put up some results in tron is a pretty nutty thing to sort of see in in the format from where it was a few years ago it, it but, just it feels so lazy to have this argument well clearly you're not brewing hard enough you know what i mean or why don't you just wait and see what they downshift and ask for better cards instead of asking for bans it's like i don't know what wizards is coming up with yeah it, it's it's putting a lot of eggs in a hypothetical basket yeah yeah and and i this is the exact same reason i don't like theory crafting on downshifts or theory crafting new cards in the format that's like a make-believe format that just doesn't exist and it doesn't affect us in the here and the now yeah it, it's really it's really difficult to talk about deep hypotheticals when they're just that like it, it's like magical christmas land but for a format instead of for your janky combo deck yeah that that's a pretty reasonable way to put it like it it just doesn't have a real basis in reality. Um, 
and we we have seen like i don't want to diminish the fact that like especially with we recently covered uh andrew brown's comments on twitter from r&d talking about how they're trying to push complexity at a common level and power level at a common level and i think those can be true and still say hey i really doubt they're going to print something as good as gush or a really succinct answer to gush because i don't even know what a good answer to gush looks like at yeah this point. it's 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 basically a counter spell but right? like a count like guttural response like w- w- what counter spell yeah. are you looking for here yeah that, that's that's what that's my point like the the answers to gush already exist they're just not good enough yeah like i'm, I'm imagining like like so, how, someone how, how do you print this like a, z- a zero mana counter spell that just says if you control a plains swamp forest or isle or mountain like someone pointed out i can't remember where discord maybe um that a bunch of decks have come prepared to beat gush and yet like four copies of gush were still on the top eight of the challenge for copies for for gush decks is what i mean so it's like it's not that people aren't preparing for the card it's that it's really just that good yeah and yeah i just it's one of those things where i just don't even know what an answer will look like to gush like because in my mind the most likely thing if there was something that allowed a deck to be on par with the decks running gush it's going to be something like monarch it's going to be another thing that just sort of props itself up as a pillar of the format and sort of says hey i'm now one of your three options um and i don't really think that's a good solution like just having it like you don't you don't you don't introduce more problems to solve your first problem if if you're trying to operate in a good future proofed way like i for example i i work in web development like if you write bad code that is going to come back and bite you even if it fixes the problem in the short term like it's just a patch it's not actually fixing the problem and you're just you're just basically making a problem for yourself down the road so i really and i I think one of the big things i want to highlight is like this format will continue to exist sans gush like you could you could probably ban five cards out of this format and Popper would still be recognizable. It will be different. But like we've kind of reached a point where a large chunk of the player base has become has normalized gush as a part of the format and returning to sort of the main reason we're talking about this like it is the status quo. It is safe. It is an easy thing to continue as things have been and i think my big thing when it comes to the actual ban decision is to urge people like hey you can be brave the format will continue to survive it'll keep going even if you remove like the five best cards out of the format it'll still be popper yeah no planeswalkers yeah yeah we we, we've managed we've we can forever say at this point, I think we're never seeing common planeswalkers. Yep, I think we're safe. Yeah. Um, and again, as with always when we discuss these things, I do want to put a big emphasis at the end here. And I think the last time you even made a side comment about this, um, to sort of consider the fact that there's a real person reading the stuff you write on the internet and this isn't like a tone policing thing this isn't a like politics of civility thing this is more just like hey just just take a good long think about the thing you're about to hit post on it's not someone saying you can't have a different opinion it's someone saying, hey, try not to be a dick about this. Wow. And like that, if, if there's one thing I want people to take away from this, because I have no control over what gets banned. Please just bring the level of the discourse up 
from like where it is now so that we can move forward and we can actually have a functional community that goes back and forth on these things. Adrian, do you have anything, yep. anything else you'd like to add on, on that note? No, I agree with you. Don't, don't be a jerk on the internet. Yeah. And, and this is not just here. Just don't do it anywhere. It's real easy. PSA from Mike. Mikey yeah. P. Yeah. If, if, if we had video, this is the point where I'd put the, the more you know graphic across it, but we don't. It's so. the point where I clean my glasses and chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just take take off that uh, the jacket with the uh, the leather elbow pads. Maybe turn a chair around backwards and sit in it. Hey, kids. Hey, <laughs> te- teens. No, I, I'm not trying to undermine what you're saying. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I... I and again, we, we like to end these discussions because we know how tense they can be and how important a lot of people feel this is. We do prefer to end this on a note of like, hey, here's how we can make things better. Just raise that level, raise that bar, do a little better, everyone. Because this is not something that anyone is immune to. It's something that I work with to, you know, try and make sure that when I discuss things online, I'm doing so in a reasonably respectful manner and that I'm not just turning this into a rambling ad hominem attack on the internet. All right. Now that, now that, now that, so wrapping things up, go watch hypernormalization. It is three hours. It is very long. It will be linked below. It is very good. Please, please watch it, and maybe this episode will make sense. I think, I think, I think we did a decent job of explaining all the concepts we wanted to, right? Yeah, I think so. All right. Um, do you have anything else for us this evening, Adrian, or would you like to take us out of the show? I'll take us out on a date of the show. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. This podcast is brought to of our patrons, including Jonas SBM. Please consider supporting us just like them if you like the show. Check below this video or the description of this podcast for details on where to find us. We'd like to remind you that if you're listening to this on a platform with reviews, they're always appreciated as they boost our visibility. If you've got a tech list or idea for a topic, you can contact us either via our website or you can email us at directlycolorcommentary at gmail.com. Special thanks to my LGS Pat's Games, Mike's LGS JP Comics, and of course, L. You can find our theme song Quantitative and other great tracks over at soundcloud.net forward slash E-L-L-E-L-L-E-L-L. Until next week, this is Adrian and Mike, and we're signing off for Color Commentary.